Um, I'm Dr. Christy Gardner. For those for whom I have not met, um, I'm an associate professor and I serve as chair of our Department of Communication Arts, Theater and Art at Gordon College. And I'm so pleased to be joined by three of our amazing Gordon College alums today. And our focus is all about public relations and specifically PR in a pandemic. And joining me today is Noelle Guerin. She is principal of Crew of Two. And I think many of you in this space know her as your professor. She's teaching our PR and advertising class right now at Gordon. Uh, welcome, Noelle, good to have you. And also, also joining us um, is Rachel Margolis. Um, she is serving as senior art director for View Health. And Maggie Montero, Maggie Rizma Montero, um, she is an associate brand manager of Drizzly. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so we've got some questions um, lined up. I have some questions that I want to ask our panelists. And then for those of you who are joining us, if you have questions, we're going to make sure we save time at the end to take your questions because some of you may be wondering how you can be doing some of the cool stuff that these three are doing for their jobs. So um, hold on to your questions. Um, you can either throw them in the chat or we'll have a time at the end um, for you just to unmute and ask your questions directly. Uh, so as a way to get started in our conversation, I want to start with just some basic definitions because even at Gordon, we find ourselves talking, um, I find myself talking interchangeably between um, public relations or strategic communications or maybe even marketing. And I wonder if we could start with there with just from the three of you, um, how you would define public relations, maybe even out of your own work. And Noelle, would you take that one for us first? And we can hear from Maggie and Rachel as well. Sure. Um, so I think one of the things, and, and we talk about this a lot in my class actually, um, that differentiates public relations from branding and advertising or marketing um, and the biggest thing is that it's earned as opposed to paid media. So a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their head around it because it's more industry terminology. Um, but from a base level, it's when you're representing a brand and you're doing public relations for that brand, you're communicating with journalists to tell your brand story and share brand information with them. And those journalists in turn will share it with consumers and the public. So as opposed to advertising that would fall under a paid opportunity, so you would pay to place an ad, public relations is something that you really, the most important component of it is storytelling. And so there are so many things that play into that, um, especially from the collegiate level, as far as writing and how you communicate and so those are really important components of it. So public relations is essentially just sharing your story with the media and the public. Great, thank you, Noelle. Um, Rachel or Maggie, anything you wanna to add to that? Um, I don't think I have anything to add. I just um, work more on the creative side. So we don't do, I personally don't do as many press releases as I used to when I worked in marketing, but it all works together. And I think that's the key is that you can't like, it's not just one part, one separate part that just happens by itself. It's all working together with your campaign, with the creative, what the actual goal is of your consumer audience. All of that is tied together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think when I was in school, I always thought of PR as like that crisis management or that reactive like, oh gosh, our brand is caught in a pickle and now we've got to clean up the mess. And being actually in the industry now, um, it's so much more than that. And I love, Noah, that you hit on storytelling because I do think that is really the core of what PR is. It's answering the questions of, you know, what conversations do we want people having about our brand? What do we want to be associated with? And I work specifically on a brand team. So I often come a few steps before PR of figuring out what is that brand identity and who are we and how do we want to present ourselves out to the world? And a lot of the PR efforts kind of stem um, first from what my team mainly focuses on. But I think you nailed it on the head when you really made that differentiation of earned, earned media. So. 
Well, that's helpful, I think, to just set um, some parameters for what we're talking about. I do feel like sometimes those terms get really muddy, and I, I do that too, even when I, I use those words interchangeably. Um, so I know that each of you um, have a different piece of the pie, I guess, so to speak, in terms of this broader area, this industry. Um, and since many of the people who are joining us this afternoon, I think hope to maybe do the kind of work you're doing, could you share with us each what excites you about your work? So kind of like, why are you doing this work? And maybe give us a little bit of the detail um, of like what you do in your work, help us understand specifically your job, but what excites you about it? Um, Rachel, do you want to tackle this one first? Want to give us a little bit of insights on that creative side and what excites you about what you do? Yeah. So um, I work in, just so everyone knows, I work for an agency called View Health. Um, we're based out of Boston. And so I'm a senior art director there, which means that I do a lot of different things. Um, so I do do branding for logos and things like that. But we specifically work in the pharma industry. So we work with um, pharma companies, usually in the rare genetics uh, space. So rare diseases, rare cancers, um, like I said, rare diseases, women's health, um, those kinds of um, things. So I could be working, currently I'm working on a lot of different things. I'm working on um, branding logos for a company, website design. I'll work on um, campaign things, video shoots. So it, it's, it's higher level as well as getting into the nitty gritty of like, what does the logo look like? How does this website portray itself? Like, what are we actually talking about? Um, and then also going high level and saying like, okay, like we need to design a disease awareness campaign about this rare disease that no one has ever heard of. How do we talk to people about that? Like, actually, how do we talk to people about a disease that they've never heard of and that doesn't matter to them? How do we, how do we talk to them and cut through the noise uh, and be different um, and think outside of the box? And that's where like all that critical thinking comes in. You can't, like anybody can make a, a decent logo. Anybody can make a decent logo, but what differentiates it and like, what is the higher thinking behind that? What is the creative concept that you can make and how, how do you make an impact on those important people? Um, so yeah, I guess that's generally what I do. I do a lot of things, so it's hard to explain. No, that's great. That's great, Rachel. Thank you. Um, Maggie, what, what about for you? What excites you about your work? Yeah, I'm in a little bit of an interesting transition right now. Um, the last three years, I was actually at an agency, Mullen Lowe in Boston, um, working as an account manager there. And I did digital marketing for the DOD. And I loved the thing that excited me most about that role was like getting my hands dirty in a lot of different projects from video production to huge integrated campaigns where I focused specifically on the digital piece of that um, and website development. So I worked really closely with people like Rachel um, doing advertising for the military, not the sexiest client, um, but definitely an interesting one. Um, and then two weeks ago, I actually just took a new job at Drizzly. Um, I'm sure none of you know who they are because you're in college and you shouldn't. I'm just kidding. I don't know how old you are. Um, we are an alcohol e-commerce platform. So think of Uber Eats or Postmates, but specifically for alcohol, beer, wine, and spirits. Um, we do just alcohol because there are a lot of different laws, um, very different than delivering food or other things. So it is one of the first companies to be doing what they're doing um, from a business standpoint, I find all of it extremely fascinating. I mean, we're still rolling out in a bunch of different states because all of the laws are very different. And it's a company that started in 2012, but probably nobody knew who they were until the last year when we were in a pandemic and people were like, how do we safely shop? So the business model and the way that they're growing, all of that is super exciting to me. The pieces that I'm gonna to be touching the most on the brand team is helping us define who are we, who are um, our audiences and how do we create brand love? Um, so again, kind of what I was talking about earlier, a lot of that identity piece of how do we talk about ourselves? How do we talk about alcohol? Um, you'll see that there are other companies like us who really push this idea that like, 
they're providing the party, like drink because it's a Monday and things like that. And Drizzly is like, that is not how we talk about alcohol. We focus on the moments, we focus on the people and Drizzly is just like a part that can make that a little bit, you know, more convenient or a little bit better by creating um, those moments in a way that's convenient. So it's really interesting to me, um, this fine line that we're walking, um, because we are making something that can be easily abused even more accessible to people. So there's a huge social responsibility piece in the way that we talk about our brand. Um, And I love it. It's a completely offbeat brand. I went from talking military to having like really snappy witty um emails and and different things like that so the tone the personality is really fun and I just love being a part of that so that's a little bit about what I do that's great thank you Maggie uh Noelle what about you what excites you about your work and you have a relatively new work as well in terms of a, a job change in this last year yeah that was it was funny I wasn't originally gonna think about going to speak about that difference. Um, But Maggie actually just made me think about it because at my old agency, I would have told you that the best part was creating these massive brand activations and having the ability to be super creative and bring a brand to life in a really different way. Um, And I loved having a vision and bringing that vision to life. I think that's still a huge part of what I love and what excites me about my work. But one of the things um, and one of the reasons why I left my old agency and wanted to create something on my own um, is I felt like one of the connections that I lost as the agency grew larger was a personal relationship with founders of brands. And to me, one of the most incredible parts is seeing the look on someone's face when you have brought their brand to life and brought their vision to life. Um, And it's one thing to do that for a brand like General Motors or Ocean Spray. And it's a totally different thing to do that for an independent jewelry designer that has put her heart and soul into a brand. Um, And for me, I still love doing those large scale events and God willing, we will get back there. Um, But having the opportunity to have those one-on-one real deep relationships with brand founders um, and helping them through their challenges as business owners, like that to me has been one of the most exciting parts of this new venture. That's so great. Um, Let's talk about the pandemic um, because I'm sure that that has brought some less than exciting days um, in your work as it has for all of us, the ways that um, it has changed how we live, how we shop, how we work, um, how we learn, the fact that we're meeting like this right now, um, as opposed to in the Barrington Center on Gordon's campus. So I guess my question is this, how have you seen the pandemic Um, impact public relations, I guess maybe both on the client and the agency side or or the ways in which you touch this um, broader area of public relations. How have you seen the pandemic change or impact that work? Uh, Maggie, do you wanna start with this one? How have you seen the the impact of the pandemic? Yeah, um, I'm probably gonna keep straddling my time at the agency and my now current job at Drizzly a little bit in every answer. So I apologize about that. Um, From an agency perspective, a lot from what I was seeing at my agency, marketing oftentimes was the first budget to go for a brand. And so um, we had to learn how to work smarter and be more creative with a lot less resources. Um, So I think it forced kind of a, a much more like kind of hustle mindset from an agency of how, how do we do more with less? Um, it required us to be super empathetic and maybe pull back on certain things and really get a, a sense of what is the tone of what's going on in our audience right now? Um, we need to be sensitive to some of the things that they're experiencing. And so messaging may have shifted a little bit. Um, again, Drizzly is super unique because while a lot of brands were experiencing a low in the last year, they experienced triple digit growth. Um, and so that's just a unique experience um, 
where we are, again, tapping into um, how can we share moments in a time where, um, you know, during this pandemic, we, we may not be able to be together. So a lot of our messaging is like, oh, send this person um, a, a bottle to celebrate this or, you know, things like that. So I think we, we had an opportunity to grow there where at my last agency, we had to really start, you know, putting on our helmets of how do we approach a huge thing that's impacting people in a really tough way and join that conversation in a way that's helpful and supportive and not, um, you know, tone deaf. But Rachel and Noel, I will let you speak more on that. Uh, Maggie, I think that's interesting how you mentioned that in this particular industry, you've seen growth because of the pandemic. Uh, but Noel, you were talking just a moment ago in terms of um, that the impact on the in-person events. How have you been seeing the pandemic influence either the work you're doing directly or the industry at large? So it's interesting. Um, I think it's true that budgets, especially agency budgets, were cut across the board. I think probably the larger the agency, the more they were impacted. Um, just the, the agency structure in general, because there's a lot of overhead in agency structure. It's normally a monthly retainer, um, and it's difficult to match an ROI with anything PR related. So when a brand is focused on downsizing and sales, they're going to cut anything that they don't see with the direct sales impact and ROI. So in that way, in March and April of this year, and this is where it's kind of crazy, like the, how the overall industry was impacted because in March and April, I, I mean, it was hundreds and thousands of people that I knew personally that were furloughed or laid off. And then what happened is by July and August, all of a sudden these companies and brands were seeing a light at the end of the tunnel with the pandemic and realizing that, oh no, we just cut our entire marketing department. And now who's going to build the brand back up? So it was this crazy even LinkedIn, like if you follow along with LinkedIn and everything that was happening in agencies and companies, it went from everybody looking for work to all of a sudden everybody hiring. And it was, it was nuts. And I see that continuing in the industry. For events, um, similarly, what happened, and I can say from, from my own perspective, I remember thinking in March and April, oh my gosh, I've built a career around something that just could not effectively exist anymore. Um, and then that that buzzword pivot that we have overheard repeated all the time, mm -hmm. um, it was take, <laughs> let's take a large scale activation and event and make it virtual and let's do the whole thing on Zoom. And I mean this in the kindest way as we're sitting on Zoom right now, <laughs> but there is no way you can convince me that this is as good as sitting in a room with someone and building an actual relationship or giving a brand impression. I mean, I could sit here with, you know, a whole thing of cranberries and say, guys, you're experiencing this, right? See? <laughs> so it just like, that was the natural event planning pivot. And I've done more virtual events at this point that I can count. And I would say that was the biggest impact in the immediate, but the positive side of that and the silver lining is that A, from, from my own standpoint, if you're a smaller company, brands are really excited to work with you because you're budget friendly and scrappy and you're just used to being that way. Um, but from an event standpoint, it felt like it was gonna be forever. Um, but now things are opening up again and it's more promising. And now the appetite for events and travel is so much stronger because people are like, oh my gosh, give me an event, give me somewhere to go to because I'm so hungry for it. So it's it's ebbs and flows in a lot of ways, but I, I feel like I'm sure I speak for everybody that's sitting here. We all learned so much about ourselves and about business and growth. And I feel like in this industry, we're all better marketing, PR, branding professionals for it because you had to be creative and you had to pivot on a moment's notice and figure out a way to speak to a brand and build a brand with a lot less resources. And so when things 
go back to normal or whatever that normal is, we're going to be so much stronger because we did it in such a difficult circumstance. Sorry, that was a bit of a soapbox. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Very That's passionate okay. about this. Rachel, you want to jump on that soapbox? Sure. Um, <laughs> so, so again, on the creative side, it, it feels a little bit different, but um, at the same time, as soon as COVID hit, so again, pharma industry, just want to preface that I never worked in pharma before two years ago. So you don't need to have a medical background in pharma to work in pharma. Um, it's way more exciting than you would think. And I just like, I am got really passionate about pharma since I started working in it. And um, so like, here's a good example. Two years ago, two years ago? Yeah, oh my gosh, almost two years ago. December of 2019, we did this huge hematological conference in Orlando, Florida, and we had like three clients there. They all get these big, huge booths that are like the size of the house. And all the reps are there, doctors, healthcare professionals, nurses, research students, grad students, they're all coming here to learn about your drug, like come experience it, hear about medical papers being presented, a lot of like really fascinating stuff but there's 60,000 people and there's like hundreds of booths. So how do we design a booth that cuts through all of these hundreds of booths and educates doctors on a rare disease? How do we do that? Like, that's insane. So we built an escape room. Um, so I was on the team that designed that. So it was part of my idea. We won an award for it last year um, from the MM and Awards. Pretty proud of that. Um, so, how do we take something where you have all these doctors and healthcare professionals willingly coming to you to learn about a rare disease and then take it virtual? How do we do that? So same client, the conference comes around again, we're in COVID, there's no way we're having it live. So we are like, we got to strip it down, like go to the drawing board. How do we think about this? So it's like what Nicole said, not just a Zoom call. No one's coming to a Zoom call. They don't care. There's like 80,000 different drugs that they could come to and see a Zoom call of like some rep telling them about their drug. So how do we, how do, we do it differently? So what we decided to do was to play off of that theme of mystery. And so we designed a website that's actually a game. And so it's a game where you are the healthcare professional and you're actively trying to find what's wrong with this patient and you're getting like clues and it's, you're seeing the, their stats go up as the time goes on. And every time you get a question wrong, the patient's doing worse. And so just thinking about that in a completely different perspective from like, okay, like, of course we can make a booth that's virtual and we can slap our logo on there and we can slap a photo on there, but that's not different. That's not really that exciting for people. So just doing those kinds of different things that are really engaging. Um, we're, I can't really talk about it, but we're working on a, like a very widespread disease education campaign that will educate the general public on uh, a rare disease kind of similar to like the ice bucket challenge that happened that went viral one of those kinds of things where um you're just thinking really differently about things and covid really amplified that so you know instead of reps going into a doctor's office and handing them these beautiful booklets that i designed you know detailing them all of the information that they could possibly need to know on a disease we have to make it digital instead of them getting a binder of all this information, we need to make it digital. How do we make it different? Um, can we make it digital, but not just a PDF so that it's a little bit more interactive? Can we design websites so that people can actually interact with the pieces that we would normally show them? Um, so all of that kind of thinking was just really amplified for us um, at VIEW. And we really pride ourselves on thinking differently. I know almost every agency says that they do, so don't believe it. Um, <laughs> because we really do try and think about things differently. Uh, and it's really hard. You can see a lot of things that are done super well um, and you can see a lot of good ideas that weren't done well. Um, so just trying to focus on that and actually think about things differently. And from the human perspective, kind of what Nicole and Maggie both touched on, it's a human to human inter interaction. We are all searching for this interaction that we're looking for. Like, oh man, like I can't see my friends anymore. Like I can't see my coworkers. I don't go to the office every day. We're all searching for that interaction and how do we give it to people virtually? Um, it's been a, a lot of thinking lately. <laughs> 
Rachel, the example you gave, I think it's such um, a great uh, positive example of how you all, to use your word, Noel, pivot, how you've pivoted during the pandemic, but, but in a really positive way. And it sounds like that was a really creative way that maybe it pushed you and your team to, to kind of cut through the clutter and to use the constraints of this pandemic to come up with really creative solutions of how to um, tell the story. And I guess that's where I would like our conversation to go next. And let's just open it up if how whoever wants to respond first. Um, but let's talk some actual brands. So it doesn't have to be the one or ones that you work with. Um, it could be others. Um, but ones that you have seen have pivoted really well during the pandemic, made some changes that you think um, that, that it's worked well. And then maybe some of the not so well, some of the cringe worthy brands that you've seen like they just they're just not figuring it out so it, it, it pl plus minus thumbs up thumbs down on brands anyone want to take it first i have a good positive one yeah that's not a brand that i worked on that i was like very impressed cadbury eggs mm -hmm. have you all seen the commercial where they're having a virtual egg hunt with their cadbury eggs because if you haven't, no, look it up. To. It's freaking awesome. So it's actually an idea that we had at our agency for a different client, and it's such a good idea. Um, it's literally using Google Maps to have a virtual egg hunt. You go online and you find these eggs, and you're searching like through literally Google Maps. It's amazing. It's like Pokemon Go, but their brand. <laughs> Exactly. That's amazing. And it's like every year Cadbury eggs, like they're the thing for Easter, um, you know, little egg hunts and things like that. And just being able to take that virtual mm -hmm. and make it so fun. And like my dad played it. It's so fun. How could you not? So I think that that was done really well. And the thinking behind that, and obviously like they have the money for the execution. It's not like, you know, a small brand that's like, we have like 10 K you're like, cool, we can do nothing for you. Um, but <laughs> it's like, really i think that they did a really good job with that um a lot of banks like mm -hmm. terrible sad commercials i'm like no one cares you know things like that um just like stood out to me where like i think if they had put a little bit more thinking into it instead of trying to roll it out so fast um it could have been executed a lot better and people would be more engaged with it i love both of those examples that you gave because there's an interactive portion to it. For St. Patty's Day, um, it was maybe just even two weeks ago, Drizzly came up with an idea. Now, granted, we did this in a week um, where occasions typically are a really big time for us to throw an event, a, a drinking occasion um, for Drizzly. And so one thing we were able to do because of the pandemic is be like, oh, let's all take you to Dublin where there's a Guinness bar and we can learn about the Guinness perfect pour. There's a very specific, very scientific way to pour a perfect Guinness. And again, Drizzly is not all like, it's St. Patty's Day, get drunk. They're like, no, no, we see drinking as a craft. There's a lot to appreciate. We want to learn the history. We want to learn like a way to appreciate a good drink. So they did a Zoom where people could join in and like watch these two Irish men um, who are like Guinness professionals do the perfect pour. Now it was super interesting. We got a lot of engagement from it, a lot of actual sales, which oftentimes on kind of Noel, as you mentioned, events or certain things, it's really hard to see that conversion of how did this actually, um, you know, generate revenue for us. Um, sometimes it's just for brand awareness and things like that. But um, so it was positive, but I love Rachel just taking it that step further in the two examples you gave and like finding ways to make things more interactive. And I don't know if I know many other examples off the top of my head in this moment of brands that were able to do an event where people are actively being a part of it, as opposed to, which again, it was a really great event, the Guinness pour that we did where the most active people were doing were, you know, pouring their own Guinness, you know, trying to do it at home, things like that, so. Yeah, that's fun. We, um, that actually reminded me, I totally forgot about this because we didn't like fully get to execute it, but it will probably happen later this year. S similar like training, for doctors, um, but we, I don't know if any of you have, have heard of it, but it's actually like a video company called Pando. And so they have like hundreds of squares and it's like an interactive gaming experience, but it's all virtual. So 
we designed uh, um, this game that educated doctors, but we like, we modeled it after like a late night game show where they like have to interact with you and like choose buttons and like at their own house, they have to like find something and we send them a box of things that they like have prepared for it. Um, so like adding that level of like, we're pre-sending you a box and you're ready for when you have your event. And then it's not just, it's like a tactile experience and not just a virtual experience, but it's also virtual because you get to answer your questions and you're competing with people. Um, and that was, yeah, that was really fun to work on. <laughs> so. I would I say play, mine, I do do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. say mine is more um, general, just general what I, less than specific brands. And I think, um, both Maggie and Rachel said it, which is when people were thinking of ways to creatively interact with a consumer, that's when they were successful, when they were rushing to pivot because they literally feared that their business was going to suffer. That's when I feel like it fell flat. And I think that happened a lot because when this all started, there was no, like our vision of it was so short. Like we had to take it day by day because we had no idea how long this was gonna be. And so having the foresight to see what it was gonna be like, even when I think in terms of Super Bowl ads, like there are certain things that were already in the queue advertising wise, and you watch them and you're like, ooh, they should not have said this. Like they should have maybe pivoted and put another $5 million towards a new ad. So it's so many things like, because our world was changing every day and different social responsibility and social justice things that we were faced with on a daily basis, if brands weren't thinking second by second, minute by minute, their advertising campaigns were falling flat in general because that's how we had to operate. And, and that's why, like I said before, I think we will all be better professionals because of this, um, because we had to be thinking 10 steps ahead when there was no way for us to even see what those 10 steps ahead were. So I think it's been a true learning experience professionally for, for all of us really. 100%. So let's talk a little bit more about the digital technology side of this, because I know like what we're all doing right now, hanging out in the Zoom space, I know we're all getting very tired of that. And yet I'm wondering as um, the, the clients, the, the brands go back to maybe a new normal, in what way do you think that our use of these digital technologies um, is going to change how we do business? Like, is it gonna change PR even, even post pandemic? What do you think that impact is gonna be of digital technologies on PR? And for anyone, just feel free to jump in. I think it's gonna be really wild to see. I don't know that we'll actually know the full impact because there's just no way to know. It's like what Noelle said, we're, we're, if you're not thinking far enough ahead, but if you're thinking too far ahead, like you screw yourself so <laughs> it's, it's, totally it's, it's, it's funny I so I was at a client's office today which was funny in and of itself because I thought who are these people I haven't seen any of these people recently and I'm with them what's happening but one of the things that they were they have an interactive showroom and they're a sustainable brand and they were saying that they're never going to go back to what their sales meetings once were because their carbon footprint is so much smaller working in this digital space. And it's, it got me thinking two things. One, that I was in a client office. And the truth is the majority of my clients I have never met in person, which is crazy when I think about that. We have only met on Zoom. Um, and in a lot of ways, yes there's Zoom fatigue and there are certainly ways that we are all over it. But on the flip side, I think about the fact that I used to be traveling six times a month at minimum and that I knew every Delta flight attendant on every route from Logan to the West Coast. 
and how I can now have those same meetings I was having to fly across the country for and still be with my family and, and see my kids and not have that exhausting um, experience. So I, I do believe that as much as thank thank you, Lord Jesus, we will be on the other side of this pandemic at some point, I think there are key learnings. And if we didn't take those learnings with us and grow from them, then we'd be doing ourselves a disservice. And even from a cost standpoint, we've learned we don't physically have to pay rent in an office in order to be a successful company. We don't have to be at a desk, eating our lunch at a desk, which is truly part of agency culture and was for a very long time in order to be an effective professional. So all of these things are like, we're rethinking the workday, we're rethinking in-person meetings. And one of the things that um, the sales rep that works with this client I saw today said is, I, I don't want to be schlepping samples across the country. I want to have less but more meaningful interactions with clients. And I was thinking of this when you were talking about doctor education, Rachel, like that doesn't mean that sales reps can't have a personal relationship or pharma reps can't have a personal relationship with a doctor. It just means it's going to be quality over quantity. 100%. Yeah, so true. And definitely playing, so playing off of what you said, the, the money and the carbon footprint thing will never go away. Um, I used to work in the luxury jewelry business um, before I went into agency life. Um, and like watch brands and jewelry brands, they would fly out every, every single owner who had their jewelry in their store to no matter where they would go. So watch brands, they go to Switzerland twice a year jewelry brands, they fly out to Vegas. Yeah. And it's like, you cannot actually understand how much money goes into these booths. Like I'm not exaggerating millions of dollars per booth, millions. And that's not even the people's time and the, the dinners, which are another couple hundred thousand dollars. And it's like, realistically, you can fly the president of that company, the CEO to every single jewelry store and still save money, still save money. And it's like, that will never go away. They'll, companies now are like, why would I spend $8 million on a booth when I can spend a million and a half and get every single like jewelry person in a room by themselves. And, and I think that that won't go away. I think that that mindset, maybe not universally, but in some aspect will for sure stay for a while. Yeah, I'd have to agree in regard to, um, reaching consumers through technology. And while I think you're right, I think we have such an appetite for when things do open up to be actually doing those activations or those different events in person, we're craving that. But I also think to your point, we've seen insights of, there are actually other ways to do this. It doesn't have to be, you know, we're confined to one space or the other, but how can we actually have a little bit of both thinking about, you know, the St. Patty's occasion activation that we did do virtually, I'm never going to be able to go to Dublin. We can never get, you know, X amount of, you know, millions of people that tuned into it, fly them all to Dublin to be able to hold um, a successful event. But no, we have grown, you know, a tolerance for being able to join into these events, you know, all across the world. For Cinco, we're thinking, okay, how do we do an event in Mexico and invite everyone virtually to Mexico to do an event like this? And so I think now we have this opportunity to say, you know, I love these in-person events. Soon, hopefully we'll be able to do those again. And then also how can we have a really authentic Cinco de Mayo experience in Mexico and let people be a part of that? Well, we can do these virtual events that people are actually, while yes, fatigued and, you know, a little over them, um, I think it allows us to make those connections um, a little bit better. And I think that trend will probably continue to some extent, even when things go back to normal. Um, and I think they'd be smart too. I don't know. Oh, this is so More great. inclusivity. <laughs> yeah, and, and cost, right? I mean, some of the things mm -hmm. you pointed out in terms of just budgets that we may not go back fully. Um, well, I want to watch our time and make sure that we have time to open it up for questions. And you all may have questions for each other too. Uh, but before we do that, because I know that there's so many students that are here 
And I'm going to start with this one because I'm, I'm guessing this is one of the questions because I think many of these students would like to be doing something like what the three of you are doing. And all three of you at one point sat in a spot similar to the students here since you're all Gordon College alums. Um, what advice do you have for the students here if they are interested in doing work in public relations? What general advice would you give them? I will start because I was I'm closest to you all. I'm only a few years out, um, but I will tell you right now, you are already leaps and bounds ahead of where I was when I was sitting in your shoes because of a lot of the efforts that Dr. Gardner is doing and being able to be taught by someone like Noel. So you're doing great. Um, what I will say though is. Networking is huge, um, especially when it's extremely competitive out there. And I'm going to tell you, it is. Um, it's not like Gordon is known for our communications department the way that maybe a Syracuse is known for their marketing department, things like that, or not department, degree, area of study. Um, however, that will not keep you from getting into really big agencies or, you know, these jobs in the city. Um, so I would encourage you to network like crazy. There's so much that I didn't know when I left. I really thought if I wanted to do advertising, I'd have to be on the creative end. And I'm like, I love being creative, but I'm actually not that good at doing it myself. I don't know how I'm ever going to get into that type of role. And then I had a couple of conversations just over coffee with people that were in the industry. And I was like, oh, there's a brand team, there's like account people, you know, there's so many different roles that are in this industry and you probably know like this much of them, I don't know, maybe more, I knew this much of them. And so like talk to people, figure out like where your strengths are because you may not know exactly what it is you wanna do, but by having those conversations, you can get like a much better idea and then networking. Any job I've ever gotten is because not because I knew someone, but like it has to start. The only way I really think to get your foot in the door, at least to begin with, is by having someone that can advocate for you because it is so competitive out there. Um, so LinkedIn, all three of us, and message us, knock down our doors, find another Gordon alum, like force it because I think it's entirely necessary. Um, so don't feel bad, don't be timid, like, just do the work because I think it will benefit you, especially if you're trying to stay in Boston where like it's such a small world. Um, so once you get connected, I think you'll be like, oh, wow, I actually have a really good toolkit of people that I can reach out to. Talking a lot, I'll let you guys go because I know we're running out of time. Um, I don't know. I guess I have, I would say like very similar things to Maggie. I think I personally had a leg up because I actually started working full time when I was a sophomore in college. So um, I like got into the industry pretty early um, in like any aspect you can. That doesn't mean that you need to get a job at an agency and to be in the industry. Like start, like Maggie said, network with people. You will meet people. You can do work for them. You can get paid for it like you should get paid for it. Just because you're a student doesn't mean you're worth nothing. And I want to reiterate that again, just because you're a student does not mean that you are worth nothing. When you get out of school, you should get paid for the work that you do. Do not let people make you do work for nothing because that is bullshit. Straight up. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And Rachel, just, you might be one of my favorite people I think I've <laughs> ever interacted with. But go on. <laughs> yeah, just literally meet people, talk to them, tell, be proud of what you do, be proud of your talents and play off of them. Like Maggie said, maybe you're really creative, but like graphic design isn't your thing, but you want to work on like campaigning. Okay, that's fine. There are ways to do that and not necessarily have to be a designer. If you're a copywriter, I know a bunch of copywriters who are some of the best creatives I know. They come up with incredible ideas that can just be blown into these amazing things. And there are just opportunities for everyone. Um, and just don't doubt yourself. Um, you're able to do it. And I think that's just really important. Like you get out of college and you're like, I'm this baby. Like no one trusts me with anything. Like make people trust you. If you want something, go for it. You go get that. Amen, sister. Like, literally, 
Like the reason I got my first like real, real job out of college was because I walked in and I was like, you need me, you need me. And this is why. And Mm -hmm. like, they were right. I was right. (laughs) And um, I just think that it's really hard to remember that. And it's really scary. And after I left there, it took me like six months to find a new job. And that's scary too. That's really scary. But it's real and like, don't let yourself get down about it. I had probably, not exaggerating, 25, 35, maybe even 50 interviews before I landed at View. And Mm -hmm. it's okay to be picky about a job. Um, I think that's really important too, because your job, you spend the majority of your life there. Like, think about that. You, I spend the most time working. I work from eight in the morning until 6.30 at night. That's where I spend most of my day. I don't spend it with the people that I love. Like, it kind of sucks, but it's reality. And like, so pick your workplace wisely. Welcome to I, advertising. Welcome to advertising. It's, I this can't say is the, I are you sure here. you want to do this portion of yeah. the panel? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's it's good. I love advertising, but just think about it. (laughs) I just want to thank you guys for basically supporting all of the things that I tell my students in class, because (laughs) if anyone in here right now is in my class, they know that I say all of these things repeatedly, like please network, talk to as many people as possible, get yourself on LinkedIn. It's so important. And the truth is, like Maggie said, it's not, you're not bothering us. Like, I think we all feel, or the majority of Gordon alumni that are in positions where we can be helpful, we want to do that. Like we are more than happy to help. Like there's nothing that makes me happier than connecting a student with an internship or connecting them with a job opportunity. Like, I feel like if I could just do that all day, I happily would because it's so gratifying. And to see somebody enter a career path that they truly wanted to be a part of and then be successful in it. Because at the end of the day, like, yes, your GPA is important and I would never take that away from you. But as you're entering your career, it's more important that you're confident, you make the right connections and you work hard. And all of those things, people that worked for me or people I interviewed, like that is what mattered most to me. I could take somebody and I could teach them anything, but if you don't come in there with confidence in your work and what you do and the drive to work hard, nothing else matters. Like that is the most important thing in this industry. So I can't, I can't stress that enough or reiterate what Rachel and Maggie said enough, like connect connect with as many people as possible. Those relationships are so incredibly important. Okay, you know, we're gonna be getting lots of LinkedIn uh, connections after this session. (laughs) Rachel, did I cut you off? (laughs) No, I was just gonna say, something that someone told me a long time ago that really resonated with me is just to always do your best at everything. Like no matter what you're doing, no matter how small, just do your best. And like, Mm -hmm. that will literally show so much. And like, that's it. Just do your best at whatever you do. Well, let's open this up. What questions y'all have? You've been hearing uh, our esteemed panelists talk and giving you some advice. Um, This is your moment. You've got their captive attention. Um, If we're, I think we're a small enough group, feel free to unmute or if you need to like wave your hand or something, I can call on you. But what questions do you have for any of our panelists? I think you've scared them all. <laughs> oh no. We, we out-talked them. <laughs> I know. Oh dear. I know. I feel like we're go- doing a good job emphasizing how important it is to communicate effectively <laughs> as a marketing professional. <laughs> um, hi, I have a question. Uh, first off, thank you everyone for sharing. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, So I just wanted to know from your perspective, in what ways 
did Gordon specifically prepare you um, for like a life outside of Gordon? Like in any in any aspect, like what are the things that you did take from your college experience that you were able to implement in either your life or in your career? Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll go. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking <laughs> so much. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, I feel like, I don't know how honest you want me to be, but um, in many ways, not you can never be fully prepared because so much of your learning actually comes on the job. But I don't know what your major is, Rachel, but um, um, I was an art major. And I think like going into graphic design, like having done color theory with, I don't know who teaches it there now, but I, Jean taught it to me and love her. Um, and just like, also, I think my graphic design teacher doesn't work there anymore, but Tim Ferguson Souter was my graphic design teacher and he was amazing. And he gave us a really, really good um, idea of agency life. Um, he kind of actually had his own mini agency that students worked um, for. And we like literally worked with real clients um, and we learned about creative direction. We learned about website design, talking to clients, um, that kind of thing. And then also just like being able to take criticism. That is a huge thing that I learned from Gordon that you will, at least I continually need to learn. Um, because, you know, I'm sensitive, um, but it's a good thing to have other people in your life and who you work with who give you criticism and who you can, like, take a step back and be like, okay, you're right, like, I need to rethink that, um, and I think that's something that is really good at Gordon, um, you know, you get that classmates, like, giving you ideas, talking about ideas, like, okay, why did you do it that way, tell me more about that, um, and just like the community aspect, like advertising is a team job, like nothing I ever do is like just me. So I think that's really important and like learning how to work with other people and just being able to engage with them is like super important. And I, I that, that Gordon experience was really crucial for me. Yeah, um, you hit on something, Rachel, that I completely agree with. When I first started at an agency and people would ask me, how is it going? Like, what does your day look like? I would always describe it as working at an agency or even anywhere in marketing. I think this is true in the real life. Every single day is a group project. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's, Every day. You know, it's different because everyone is actually really like badass at their job and they're really talented and most of the time everyone wants to work you know you don't usually have that person that's like you guys do all the work but sometimes you know people have lives people um you never know what someone's coming into the work day with and so the fact that like every single day is a group project I think that was like the most realistic college thing I ever got from Gordon was every group project that I hated because I was always that person that like ended up having to do so much work um so like one that taught me how to grind and that taught me how to like take ownership of things and really um to like be a leader but if you like roll your eyes at group projects get ready for it because that's every single day um but also I I think you know all aspects of Gordon I, I, I feel like I was really able to come into my own there, um, really fail and be in a really safe environment, um, whether that was in school or even just in life in general. Um, and so I think just a lot of the growth that I experienced during a wild four years um, of college and wild, I just mean like, holy crap, the growth that you experienced in four years is, I mean, it's just concentrated growth in four years. Um, so that when I got out and I'm the only Christian working on my team, I do feel like I had this confidence of like, yeah, I'm a Christian by showing up every single day and doing my absolute darnest. And I want to be excellent in my work. And I think that was really stressed to me out, Gordon, is like, you didn't have to go into um, your work environment and be like, 
I'm a Christian. Hey, hey, love Jesus. And like, I think that's like what I thought it was like, that was what was expected of me. And I think I had a lot of good mentors at Gordon be like, no, you go into work and you work your butt off. You be someone that cares about your coworkers and learns how to like communicate well and be in a group environment where um, people want to work with you. And you have like this magnetic effect of just being like unashamedly yourself and like really caring about people. And those were things that I heard from teachers and from mentors at Gordon. And it rings so true in the professional world. You cannot imagine the impact that you have on your teams that you're working with every single day when you are like being everything Jesus calls us to be without having to like be super explicit um, about it. So a little sidetrack comment, but um, I, I think that has been like something I've really learned since being at Gordon and from Gordon. Oh. I'm, I'm taking notes, Maggie, add more group projects. <laughs> no, I, so again, I feel like I paid you guys on the side before you got onto this panel because that, I, I don't know if you noticed I was mouthing group projects as you were saying it because I assign so many group projects and I see the eye roll when it happens. And I have said before in class, no, this is actually practice for it's what your life. life is about to be like, because it happens all the time. And especially when it comes to whether it's an agency or an internal position, when you're branding and doing any aspect of branding, like we've said, there are so many parts to that. And in order to bring a campaign to life, every single part has to be successful. If one falls short, the whole campaign implodes and you do not want to be responsible on a group project for that happening. And also just understanding how to work well with other people and people that are different. And, um, and just to emphasize what Maggie said, there are lots of things academically that I learned at Gordon. And I think um, I would give a lot of praise to the psych department and to the English lit department. I know that Dr. Gardner doesn't like when I say this, but I was not a communications major, Ugh. but I think <laughs> everything I learned, I kind of wish I was to be honest, but everything I learned was super important um, in the career that I chose. And what was more important than all of that um, was a foundation of faith. And I can't emphasize that enough because it's, it's important in, and Rachel, you asked this, it's like, how did it help you professionally, but also in your real life? I mean, that is the most important thing and having the strength to be a light in any environment. And it's exactly what you said, Maggie. It's not like, Hey, I'm Noelle and I love Jesus. It's more leading by example and showing that there's a difference and leading people to try to understand what that difference is. And had I gone to another school, um, I, don't, I don't know that I would have been able to marry those two things because I think Gordon does a really good job of providing a faith foundation without limiting your education on what your next step is. And I think that that can sometimes, I, I wouldn't emphasize one over the other. I think it was really important to get a great education and have that foundation. And equally, if not more important to have a faith foundation. And I think understanding that those things aren't mutually exclusive was really important and something that was, that I really appreciate Gordon for. You all, this has been an amazing time. The hour went too quickly um students these three panelists this is the kind of work that you could be doing um the this is an example of of an Gordon student who is now out making um, a difference in the world being salt and light um noelle garen and rachel margolis and maggie montero thank you for your time and students reach out to them i think i heard an invitation in there somewhere to connect with <laughs> them if you have other questions i'm sure they would be happy to field them and to make those connections with you all. Um, Ryan Canister, thank you. He's our fine arts uh, manager. Thanks for setting this up for us. And we've got another fine arts salon coming up in a few weeks. We'll be focusing on film. So stay tuned for that to round out our semester. Um, everyone, thank you so much for your time.
Have a good rest of your evening. Blessings, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.